This is your coffee break. Hi friends, uh, welcome to another episode of Coffee Break, which I'm renaming Tea Break for today's episode because I'm interviewing my good friend and excellent poet Joanna Vermeer, who is an aficionado of tea. Welcome, Joe. Thank you, Sarah, for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Joe and I have been friends for a couple of years now. We met over sort of a shared love of language and writing and poetry, and also we are both introverts, and so yes. So that's why we're podcasting right now, so you can't see us. Yes, you can't see it. Also, also we have the light off, and so it's kind of dark in here. And we're talking about words, which is super nerdy. It is super mm -hmm. nerdy. Although, I was telling Joe earlier, I have a friend who's a middle school teacher, and uh, I met with her this morning, and she says, yeah, Sarah, books are cool now. Kids are like, it's cool to go to a library, and it's cool to be different. <laughs> and I was like, I was born in the wrong time. I think I was born in the wrong century. I think a lot of like introverted writery literary types feel that way. I'd go back a couple hundred years. I'd probably yeah. fit right in then. You probably would. And maybe I would. Maybe not. I, I would miss being able to I vote. think you're in the future. I'm in the future. Yes. Can I, can I tell you a deep secret about myself? I've always wanted to be. Okay, I've always felt that my calling in life, aside from being a writer, was being a like spaceship captain. I can see you doing that. <laughs> Especially like in this whole uniform, you could carry it off. <laughs> as long as I could be like Ripley and have a cat on board my ship. With that... laser eyes. Yes. And it would like burn my enemies. I'm totally going to write a novel about this, like fan fiction of myself as a spaceship captain. Well, I'm glad the <laughs> the world decided to put us together at this time <laughs> period so we could meet. Maybe, maybe it like averages us out. You're 200 years ago, I'm 200 years in the future, and like our paths collided so that we could record this podcast episode together and talk about poetry and tea and wonderful things. I'm very trad. You really <laughs> you'll find out. Good. No, that's good. And and so uh, Jo said this is her first interview. Properly interviewed. Proper. This is her mm -hmm. first proper interview. She won a poetry contest. When I was in high school. When you were in high school and you got interviewed for that. But this is like your first post-high school interview. Usually I'm the one interviewing. Okay, wait, tell me more about that. So I do interviews for, I'm a professional writer, so I write during the day. Gotcha. Um, I get paid to write, which is wonderful. <laughs> but I'm usually the one on the other side interviewing clients. Gotcha. So this is a fun experience to be on the other side. Well, cool. And uh, let me know if there's any questions I should be asking you, because I think you have about 90 times more experience interviewing than I do. I just listen. You just listen. And try and pull out what they're saying. So, Joe, tell me a little bit about how you got into writing. I've always been a writer, and you could probably see precursors of my future career probably when I was a child. I was in a family where literature and writing and reading and the arts were very encouraged. And so my parents brought up a good foundation within me. I would always write letters to like my Aunt Mary and we were pen pals. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and so I would always have cards. I would be always the one sending cards in our family. And I still do actually. I'm addicted to stationery, by the way. Oh my gosh, I know. Confessions. <laughs> I like of a the writer. <laughs> confessions of a writer. And and you do still do that. I have yes. um, at my desk here at work, I have several handwritten missives from my good friend Jo because, yes, she is a stationary addict and I get to benefit from that. So I've, I've always written in some fashion or form. Um, I wrote my first poem when I was 12 and I've been writing ever since then. What was so, your first poem about? A Sunset. I can see you writing about a sunset. Did you ever go through a period of your life where you wrote angry or angsty poetry? Like, I did that. I wrote about, like, the blood in the night is dark and everybody is grim. And I went through that, like, melancholy goth stage. And, and I'm curious if you ever did because you're just so, like, lovely and peaceful and calm. I don't know if I've ever written angry poetry. It's more... I would probably go more depressive or mm. moody. I don't know if I've ever written an angry poem or a poem out of hatred. Not that I can recall. I think that would be really outside of your character, but maybe not the melancholy stuff so much. I tend to be reflective and introspective, so a lot of my poems are that way. So right now, you are writing for a living? 
Yes, I am. And then you're also writing poetry on the side. Yes. And you have with you today two volumes of poetry that you've written. Yes, I did. I brought them along. (laughs) And this is actually the first time I've seen them. One of them is in paperback. One is in hardback. Both are available for sale on, I want to say, Amazon.com. Yes. The other one is available on Blurb, and I can give you the link. So if any of your readers would like to check it out, they can buy it later. Perfect. Um, I will, as Joanna just said, make these links available to you in the show notes for today's episode. So you write for a living. You write for fun. How do those mix or do do they ever not mix well? Or are you ever drawn to write more professional or more poetry? Like how do those inter interplay maybe is the word I'm looking for? Well, I love that I get up and get to go to work and write every day because that's what I want to do. It's who I am. I don't think I would be a happy person if I couldn't write every day. So I love that I do it for my professional career. I've always been super blessed to be able to do that. How many people get to say that they can (laughs) love what they do for a living? I'm amazingly honored to have worked at multiple companies. Um, I work as a marketing copywriter, so I love, I love doing that. They mix, I used to write more when I was in college, to be perfectly honest for myself. Uh, When you come home after writing all day, as you know, Mm -hmm. as a professional writer as well, (laughs) you're kind of spent and you don't have a lot of creative juices flowing. Um, You do your best, but I tend to write more for myself on the weekends, when I'm on vacation, when there's less thoughts of work occupying my mind. So it's it's a balance. Um, I would say I have written less for myself personally in the last several years. How does that feel? I feel like a psychologist. Like, how does that make you feel? But, like, how does it? I wish I could write more for myself. Of course, every writer would probably say that. I think it's important for me to have a writing job as a career so I can write on a daily basis. Otherwise, I might not force myself to write every day because when I write for myself, I usually let it come to me which is a big difference from having to go sit down at a desk and write something every single day. So both are good for me. It's almost like exercising versus going out and dancing on the weekend. Oh my gosh, I love that analogy. So when you sit down to write creatively, you kind of only do it when you're inspired to? Uh, When it comes to me. Tell me a little bit how that process works, like with like, or how you imagine it works. It's kind of hard to explain. I feel like I'll see something in life. It could be something within nature. I'm very inspired by nature. It could be a life circumstance that I've been through. It could be a long time ago, to be perfectly honest with you. It could be something happening to me now. And I'll have that moment or that idea in my head. It may go directly onto paper at that point, or it may sit in my mind for a while. For example, one of my poems in my new book, was a scene that I witnessed off a dock. I was looking at water. um, And I think that scene sat in my head for several years, and I didn't write anything about it. And then I wrote a poem about it a couple years later. So, I mean, it it might be instant. It might take a while to uh, marinate up there. So it just really depends. And I don't know if there's any logic or rhyme or reason as to what will spark something in my brain to want to write about it. But when I do see it, I know it and I'll be compelled within myself to put something down on paper to describe it. It could be something extremely beautiful that I want to try and describe to the world. It could be something that's painful that people need to know about. It could be a different way to look at something the way somebody hasn't seen it before. And that's kind of what I try and do with my poetry to reflect the world, but also to use it as a mirror so that they can see maybe in the corners of the world in a way that they hadn't seen before. So that's what I try and do with my poetry. You talk about these ideas coming to you and then having to marinate. How do they, do they come to you as like an, as more often as an image or as like a phrase like the, of words that sounds good together that you want to play around with? Um, Neither, actually. I feel like if anything, it's like a picture and they're like It's hard to describe. Think of a stream Mm -hmm. and currents flowing down a stream, and then suddenly all the words start coming. That's probably the best way to describe what's going on in my mind when a a poem comes to me. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. So I've written a little bit of poetry in my life. Actually, that was my focus in college was poetry. 
But whenever I had an idea come to me, it would be a phrase. It would be, okay, this is going to sound stupid, but it would be like a phrase that I wanted to decorate. And so it would be like my centerpiece of my puzzle. And then I would want it to like flower outward from there. But there was always one phrase that I would lock on to. That's how mine would come to me. Mine's a little bit more organic. I it feel is. like it didn't, it doesn't start with the word. There's a very common question that often writers get asked, and it's, how do you get your ideas? But I, I think that a much more interesting question is, how do those ideas come to you? Like, in what form? And so yours come down like a stream, and mine come in like little little patchworks of words kind of semi-formed already. I think it's important to watch for them, no matter what method the tell, ideas come Tell me come more to. about that. I think it's important as a writer, and I think everyone would agree that's listening, that's a writer, to be observant. I think that's the first and most important rule of being a writer. And so if you're not paying attention, if you're not listening to the world around you, if you're not seeing things going on around you, there's no way that you can be sparked by ideas. Basically, to just shut up and <laughs> listen to the world. Do you have any, so for people who that's, you know, difficult for, like, there's a lot of really cool, bombastic, outgoing people. Do you have, like, any advice for them on how to shut up and listen to the world? I think part of it is personality. You're just kind of born with it. Maybe sometimes part of it is, might need to be exercised or practiced, just like introverts like you and I need to practice being more outgoing and yeah. <laughs> being more confident with speaking. Um, like we're doing now. I know you're, you're being podcasting. Awesome. <laughs> I think it can be taught and I think it can be learned. I think other people, it probably comes to naturally being observant and being quiet. But so. you think it's possible for everybody? I think you can get to a level of observance and that usually comes with shutting your mouth. <laughs> Which is hard to do. It's hard to not only shut your mouth, but maybe to also shut off your phone or shut off the TV or shut off a computer as well. Well, we talk too much, I think, as a, as a society, as a generation. I feel like there's so much beauty around us that we miss it. Because we're caught up in creating our own beauty? I think all of us want to self-express, so I won't diss self-expression. I think it's extremely important. I think we're more caught up with everything going on around us, and we don't center ourselves. Tell me more about the idea of centering yourself. I think it's just mindfulness, being cognizant of who you are as an individual and what you bring to the world. Jo always just has this centeredness around her that I just really, I envy you that a little bit. And that's just such a deep part of your character. And I think that's why maybe you're just drawn to be a poet and write poetry. It probably would naturally come along with my mentality and my personality. One of the best compliments I've ever gotten is that I was a gentle and quiet spirit. That's how I was described as. And so I feel like poetry is an extension of of my being and everybody who's a writer is it's an extension of their being so it kind of goes hand in hand and one of the questions I get a lot is well why don't you write novels or why don't you write full books or why don't you write this or that and I'm why do you why poetry why poetry specifically and I feel like the way my mind is designed is like um, a poem is like a shooting star within the universe. And I try and grasp it and capture it and put it on a page so that other people can see that, see that beauty and, and see it shine. I feel like a novel is an entire universe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so I know where I am the strongest and the best and that's with a one sucker punch with a poem and so I've always stuck to poetry I've never done short stories I've never done full-length novels um, maybe in my future I don't know you never you can't predict what your future is but poetry is so much a part of me just like writing professionally is so much a part of me if I can't do that I can't breathe that is really powerful. And I, I love the image of you putting yourself into the poetry. How do you, do you ever think about how your poetry interacts with the reader? I do. In fact, one of my poems in my new book is called Reader. And it's, I should let you read it, or we could read it aloud here if you want to. But it, I'm basically talking to the reader, looking down at the page and describing what they must be feeling and what I am thinking with us both looking at each other at the same time. <laughs> Wait, would, you, would you read that for us? Let me find it. And do you need a flashlight? Because it's, <laughs> it's dark in here. This is Reader 
from my new book, Syllables and Other Poems. Reader, who are you with your wide-eyed stare, your eager lifting hands, your beating heart, hugging me close like a mother and child? I look up with amazement, wondering at your face, and time stops as you drop your gaze to meet mine. Thank you for sharing that. I've had people interact with my writing in ways I've never even thought of. I'm like, what? You used it for that? You That's know? awesome. But um, I think that people will always use your writing in ways you never thought of. And I love that about writing. You know, we talk a lot about like intellectual property and like what belongs to who. And are, are you usually pretty willing to share your poetry? It's a very personal thing as all writers know. So it's kind of hard to share your heart and put it out there. If they ask, I will share my writing with them. I don't want to give it to people who are interested in it necessarily. But yeah, I think it's very important to share it to the world. I don't like, oh, that's mine and you may not use that. I think more of it, as I said before, as art. People will see what they want in your writing. It will speak to them in different sorts of ways. So it's more like, and I've never cared about making money from it or being some type of economic financial success. I love the look on your face right now when you say financial success. (laughs) Maybe it's the artist in me coming out. (laughs) It must be. You just have this, like, your face just twisted into this grimace with financial success. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. I'm kind of the anti-popular person, I think, and I'm cool and good with being that person in the room. Tell so. me tell me more about that. Is this just because you were born two centuries too late or maybe. Maybe. <laughs> maybe I was raised probably very much differently than most people where I was uh, raised at home and I was homeschooled. So I'm used to being alone and used to not thinking the way all my peers think and being okay with that. I think it's really important to be an individual and not to be pulled in multiple directions by what your peers want you to think or what your peers are doing or what they're saying is cool. I think friends, true, deep, and intimate friends are rare, and those are the people that I like to surround myself with. Popular culture is not really high on my list of things to absorb. Tell me your favorite poem, Sarah. Oh, gosh. Okay, so I have two favorite poems that have really stuck with me over the years. Both of them I have on my, I have this like little cork board with ideas and inspirational things on it. And of course, some of Joe's handwritten notes are up on that cork board. One of the poems that's up there is a poem by Franz Wright. And I think it's under copyright, so I don't think I can read it to you. But it's called Publication Date, and it talks about being a writer and being upset. And it has this really, it transitions into this very beautiful, delicate imagery, and then it ends with a statement about art. And it's just, whenever I'm, I don't know, not not feeling the writing, I look at that and I just remember that it's okay. It's like a balm. Yes. Poems can do so many different things. Yes, they can. And they're so ancient in art form. The Psalms and the Bible are so old. And yet we have people think of poetry as like a lovesick puppy, you know, and they're trying to woo someone. And the poetry section at Barnes and Noble is disparagingly small and it makes (laughs) me sad. But poetry is everywhere. Poetry is what life is about. It's in songs. It's in songwriting. It's in graffiti on walls. It's in a magazine. It's on a billboard. It's everywhere. And I am sad that people have such a narrow view of poetry. Is that something that you're I mean, it's really hard to be like a poetic activist, but like, is that something you would like to see changed or change somehow? I feel like there are efforts, too. I feel like the poet laureates try and do that a lot. I feel like each state has somebody that goes out and tries to further that as a cause. But I feel like it doesn't really take off because it's not the cool thing to do. And I'm like, this is why I think I was born in the wrong century, because two or three hundred years ago, this was what people did. You know, it was important to have this as a voice. And I don't feel like today's generation maybe feels like poetry is them, but it's all around them and they just don't realize it. So like even being observant in that way and not just observant in like seeing the sunset or, or, you know, hearing 
I don't want to say hearing messages because that sounds kind of schizophrenic. Hear, but... Hearing your own voice. Yes. And, I, and I'm not ashamed to say I have voices in my head. And that's part of being a writer, I think, I think that, that they come to you. I think it is, too. I sound like Joan of Arc right now. You're going to have to burn me at the stake. I hear voices in my head. You're Joanna of Arc. <laughs> I promise we won't burn you at the stake. Oh, my gosh. That would be awful. Poets, in essence, are philosophers, I feel. I feel like they're idealists. I feel like I'm somebody who looks at the world, and I want to make it better, or I want people to see things that they're blind to. I want them to know how actions or how nature works I want them to slow down I want them to see that and so that's also why I write poetry I think I know that we've talked before you 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 feel out of place with that mindset but I don't know do you ever do you ever feel like you have trouble belonging into a culture that's like changing so swiftly I try and embrace change. I'm not the greatest at change, as most of my close friends and coworkers <laughs> will agree. I try and fight change a lot, and it makes my life more difficult than it needs to be. I think adapting to it while bringing your point of view is the most important thing. So I actually write poems on my phone, for example, my smartphone. So, I mean, language will never change. People will always self-express. It's more of how you do it and where you're doing it that evolves over time. I mean, people used to write on scrolls or rocks, right? Now we're writing on phones. So as long as you take who you are and adapt yourself to that changing world, I think you can still offer a strong and valuable voice that needs to be heard. And I love that modernism. I love that technology have taken us in so many ways so that we can spread language. We're living in a century now where we can create things with basically no limits, like podcasts, like vlogs. These are important things, and I feel like our voices are heard more than ever before, but I feel like the person we probably listen the least to is ourselves. And so through poetry, that's where I center myself. Can you tell me a little bit more about that, about listening to yourself? It's hard to sometimes because there's so much going on in your world. A lot of the time I have work in my head. I'm one of those people that doesn't shut their mind off (laughs) at 5 o'clock. I don't know how people do that. My husband does it. I don't know how he does that. Shutting off all the ambient noise, I think, is really important. What about you? How do you... You know what? I know exactly what you're saying. Mine comes through a little bit differently, but when I'm, so I write novels. And so when I sit down to write, it's like turning on a faucet. It's not always like that. It's not like the words come dumping out, but the the imagery does and the ideas do. And oh my gosh, I'm, I'm having a revelation like right now. You are, you are listening to me have a revelation that's When I sit down to write, I'm actually giving myself the time to listen to myself. And I think it's really the only time that I can not necessarily speak truthfully, but like understand the truths within myself. It's so important to you. And when I don't write, you know, I get depressed, I get sick, like physically ill. It's, I don't know if it's, it's psychosomatic or or what have you, but it happens. And I wonder if it's just because I'm getting further and further out of touch with my real self. I think we change over time, too. So to be patient with ourselves and let ourselves grow and evolve, I think our voices change over time, as many writers and artists' voices change over time. And so being comfortable and confident in your voice, no matter what, as you grow, as you mature as an artist, I think patience is a virtue, and I usually don't have a lot of it. (laughs) I don't And I think a lot of artists don't because they want to have perfection right away. I suffer from that a lot. I like it to come out of me the way I want it to stay on the piece of paper. You know, I don't want to have to edit. I don't want to have to revise. It feels like a failure to me that I didn't create something original and perfect in the first go. I'm so frustrated with myself that I think that way and that artists think that way, other writers think that way. I feel like if we were talking about any other type of profession, like a scientist or an inventor, When they fail at something, people are like, oh, that's okay. You know, you just learned a different way to do it and just give it another shot. Try it again or whatever. You know, it's cool. But when writers fail, it's like, oh, you're a failure. Your book is unfinished. Your book 
didn't get printed. You didn't make a million copies, whatever the goal is. And I'm like, why? We just learned a different way not to write something. Why, do, why are we like that to ourselves? Is I wish it, we weren't that way. I know. I wish we weren't either. I think it's because writing comes from a place that's so personal. We are the source of it. Uh-huh. And so we ourselves are the only one to blame if it doesn't come out the way we want it to come out. Yeah. Maybe for a scientist, like, oh, the chemicals went bad. Or I that, I know nothing about science. But... E equals MC squared. <laughs> yes, E equals MC squared. Negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC over 2A is the quadratic formula. I'm podcasting with Einstein here. Well, no, you're the one who said E equals MC squared. <laughs> That's so true. Technically, you're Einstein. <laughs> I don't know who invented the quadratic formula. My knowledge of it ends with reciting the quadratic formula. This is why we're like communication majors over here. Yeah. <laughs> Words, <laughs> verbs. Yep, yep. What's your favorite part of speech, Sarah? Oh, um, I like nouns. I like naming things. I like properly naming things. I think that there's a magic in naming things. You know, Adam and Eve, the first thing they did was like run around and name everything. I think it's important. What about you? I like verbs. Tell me why. Action. (laughs) Action. I used to like adjectives and I used to like adverbs, but then I kind of grew out of that. I still like them a little bit. You know, that's like seen as the weaker Mm. parts of speech by a lot of writers. You know, you're a strong, crisp writer if you don't Mm -hmm. use a lot of those. And, you know, like in the secret part of my heart, I'm like, I still (laughs) like adjectives. I don't care what you say. (laughs) Shimmer away. (laughs) But yeah, probably verbs. Verbs are my favorite. Action, Joe. Did you diagram sentences? No. Can I tell you a story? I did not learn grammar in the parts of speech until I was in college. Have I told you this before? No. Okay, I know. So, okay, I read a lot growing up. I read forever and ever. And so I think when you... I read War and Peace in high school. Did you? Because you're magic. Because I'm a nerd. And I also got... (laughs) This is Joanna, classic example for you. I got an interlibrary loan for Edmund Spencer's A Fairy Queen when I was in high school. Because you're amazing and also a nerd. But nerds are amazing. That's the transitive property. (laughs) If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Look at me. I'm just like pulling out all of my like middle school. I interrupted you. Oh, you're fine. So I, I, what what was I saying? Oh yeah. Okay. So you read a lot. I read a lot. And and when you read a lot, you just pick up the way that language works. It's just, it it just settles into your mind and you, you so you just didn't learn your notes. Yeah. I like, I'm like a sight reader, like, or, or play, by, play ear. by ear, right? Not a sight reader. I'm terrible at that. Yeah, no, I, I, I learned it all by ear. And so then finally, and, and I did this because I went to a school district and maybe a lot of people had this too. And I was always in the advanced programs and they just kind of assumed that we had learned grammar somewhere along the way. And so I was always like reading more advanced books, but I had no idea what a participle was or a clause or yeah, I see Joe's making this face right now. And, and so I never learned grammar. So I was in college and I took modern English grammar and I was like, finally, I'm going to learn what a adjectival phrase is or, you know, whatever. And it was hard. And it was like, I know this is right, but I can't explain why it's right. Like, so I always know when to use who or whom, but I can't tell you one's objective and one's subjective. I don't know the difference. So I didn't diagram a sentence until I was in college. And even then... Everybody else knew grammar that was in this class. And so we were talking about how grammar changes. And I was like, wait, I don't even know the first thing about this. Please tell me, you know, what a, what's it is. So it was frustrating and hard. But just because it was like, if you can do math in your head, being expected to like show your work is always really hard. Like long division, but for sentences. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. And I'm good at doing it in my head. But if you ask me to show my work, I'm like, I don't know. Just, just believe me. Just this is this is right. Just take my word for it. So I brought my Norton anthology. <gasps> Look how thick it is. I love this. Well, how many? Okay, so that's got to be four or five inches, don't you think? It is. Well, which Norton anthology is it? I'm trying to see. Seventh edition of of like English lit. English lit. Because I have one. Which one's yours? I don't have the English lit one. So I have the Norton anthology of American literature. I have the Norton anthology of African American literature. And I have the Norton version of all of the Shakespeare ever written in the entire universe. Atta girl. Hey. Can I, can I tell you another secret? I don't like Shakespeare. Really? Yeah. Any of it? I don't like, okay, Joe has this incredulous look on her face right now. And, and I. Sonnets? I think, plays? Or okay, what? So, sonnets I get. Okay. The plays, I didn't understand. Like, I couldn't understand the language. And maybe it's because I couldn't diagram sentences. My little brother is so sweet. I love him to death. And he's he's like, 
I don't get poetry. He's like, I don't understand why Joe likes poetry. He's like, why don't they just say what they mean? <laughs> well, that's when you read Hemingway. Although, you know what? His, he's, like, he uses plainer language, but he's just as subtle as any poet. I, I want to randomly open up this Norton anthology. That it's Joe tea brought. stained because oh. I had it in my backpack in college and I had also apparently a thermos of tea <laughs> with the lid not on properly. Oh. And so it's stained, but I kept it. You know how you're supposed to sell back your college books when you leave college. And I, I couldn't know. give that one up because English lit was my favorite class. I never did. I kept all my books. Okay, ready? I, I want you to hear what this book sounds like when I open it because it crinkles. Can you hear that? It's a beautiful sound. I love the sound of paper. It sounds like a boat creaking. Okay, I opened it up to um, A Visit to Newgate by Charles Dickens. Do you remember reading A Visit to Newgate by Charles Dickens? I don't. I don't think we made it that far. No, probably not. (laughs) Well, some of these have bookmarks. Or no, maybe it's just, oh, you have a page that came out. Oh, George Gordon, Lord Byron. Love him. He was a little bit of a not nice guy and did some things he probably shouldn't have done, but But he's a good poet. Come on. Wasn't wasn't he like the original like brooding hero figure, right? Like we talked about. I want to say he was incestuous. I might be thinking of a different one. Maybe. Oh, that's a little uncomfortable. Maybe I don't want a Byronic hero. (laughs) (laughs) Let's fact check this after the podcast. Oh, Heart of Darkness. I read that. I did. I did read that one in college. That was one of our reading assignments. What did you think of it? I'm did glad that we had to read it. Did you know that he wrote the original manuscript in Polish? No. He's a cool dude. You're full of fun facts. Well, thanks. <laughs> oh, and um, I opened up the very last one that I'm going to pull here. You have, um, I'm also a margin writer, so you have some notes in the margins. That's is... not my notes. <gasps> That's a used textbook. Oh, my mm-hmm. gosh. Well, somebody... I'm frugal like that. Well, we know how you feel about financial success. <laughs> it's just taken with a grimace. So I opened up to the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot. I don't which... mind money if people want to give me money. <laughs> okay. So after this, um, send Joe lots of money or, you know, buy her book. Or you could enter me in a poetry prize. I'm cool with that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Poetry prize for scads and scads of dollars. Um, all going to Joe. So I'll make a charity fund or something out of it. A charity I don't fund. want any of it. You just want to like have money sent to you so you can be like, hee hee, people are sending me I'll money. I'll make a scholarship or something so somebody can get there you go. non-used textbooks in college. <laughs> you get the shiny. I was always a little jealous of the people who could like afford the new ones. Who gets new textbooks? It wasn't me. No, it wasn't me either. Suffice to say, we were poor college students. There's something about the act of like writing something down in the margins of a book or on paper or anything that your brain makes a tactile connection with the idea that you're expressing. And that's why, and I talk, I've been like talking about this with everybody lately, handwriting and typing, you will get such different types of writing from each one. I'm about half and half. Okay, yes. Do you, tell, me, tell me about your poetry writing process. Well, since there's no rhyme or reason as to what will spark something in me, and there isn't like a specific type of day either, I'll either be on my computer or on my phone, or I may be at home and have paper. So it really depends. And so I have poems that are like loose little children running around in all these places. I have some (laughs) on a computer. I have some on my phone. I have some pieces of paper and journals. I have them scattered all around. So the next book I do, I'm going to have to round them up because they're a little little wild right now. (laughs) They're just running around on their little legs, <laughs> like, ha, 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 catch me. But I'm about half and half, and I think maybe that's a generational thing. I don't know if I'm old school. Is your poetry, have you noticed a difference in the stuff that you write on your phone and the stuff that you write on your computer and the stuff that you I'm write I'm more forgiving hand? of myself when I write it on a computer so I can erase it better. Oh. When I erase it on a piece of paper, I can see my change, or I scratch it out or strike it out. That bothers me as a perfectionist and an OCD person. So Oh, I get that. I also hated red pens, but I come to value red pens. Tell me about your hatred of red pens. I always felt like they were pointing out errors, and that's not necessarily true with papers growing up. I feel like they also said good things, too, but the color and the standout on writing on margins of your work, I just tended not to like it. But it is needed and necessary, and it took me a long time to love the red marks. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you love them now? I want them when I get something back from a co-creative, from an editor, from my boss. I want them on there because I know those marks mean they care. If they're like, oh, sure, looks good, Joe. Publish away or whatever, you know. Then you know they didn't really look they at it. They didn't really look at it. 
Do you think there's always something to fix? Yes, because we're human and flawed. <laughs> and that's where our writing comes from. But it also shines, too, because we have little bits of brilliant, beautiful pieces in us. And I think we shouldn't let those imperfections keep us from writing. I think as writers, it's really important to stay in our craft. I think we can fade in and out of it, and a lot of artists and writers have over time. Um, you'll have your periods where you're really prolific, and then you'll go through your quiet periods. And that's okay, as long as it's not gone entirely. But if you're a writer and it's passionate and it's coming from your heart, I think you should keep doing it, no matter what the quantity is of it. And so I want to encourage people to write, no matter what you write, whether it's poetry, whether it's songs, whether it's novels, I think that everybody has a voice and that needs to be heard. And maybe the whole world won't hear it, and I know the whole world won't read my poetry, but if I can get one person to look at one of my poems and see the world in a different way, in a better way than what they saw before, I'm a success as a writer. And that's all I ask of my writing. I don't have these huge expectations piled high on my writing. I just want it to be. And maybe that's my na naiveness as a writer, as an artist, not needing money to survive. <laughs> I wish money hasn't, hadn't come up this much. I really don't think about it that much. I feel more like sharing things with the world. And as a writer, I want to encourage them to keep doing that in whatever form. And even non-writers, too. I feel like everything that we create and put out into the world is amazing and important and beautiful. And everybody should add beauty back into the world if they have an opportunity because we're not here for very long. You know, we've only been put on this earth for a short amount of time. So put something back into the world. Give back to it. I think that's our role as a human. And that's how I do it with poetry. Joe, thank you for your beautiful words and your friendship and for sharing your wisdom with us today. Thank you for having me, Sarah. I hope that we can do this again soon. I do too. Thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm.